so the last uh, <coughs> six lectures out of the 15 we have we are going to discuss the propagation of radio waves so before we discussed uh, not only antennas but problems with radiation problems with the reception of that radiation not just antennas uh, so the last thing we are left we are left with propagation what we intend about propagation uh, propagation in free space is very simple, but uh, uh, that's not usually the case. Uh, we may have, between our two couple of antennas, uh, we may have an obstacle. And uh, our, actually our uh, radio link is uh, going through this diffraction. And about diffraction we are going to talk today what happens. Uh, there are other possibilities. We may have an unobstructed view between two antennas, but we may have unwanted reflection of the ground or of other objects. So we have, I have a direct ray, but I also have a reflected wave, a reflected ray, and here uh, the reflection coefficient is different from zero. So we get some uh, reflection. Uh, what uh, may happen in some radio links uh, may happen that we have uh, layers of air with different uh, refraction indices. So N1, N2, if you have, if you have a thermal, thermal inversion layer. So if I have now an antenna up here, uh, here I'm going to experience, uh, my uh, uh, electromagnetic wave waves are going to experience refraction. I'm going to see refraction over two uh, layers of different media with different indices. This may be warm air, has a lower refraction index, uh, cold air has a higher refraction index. Well, are these differences that large? The differences between, the difference between uh, warm air and cold air is very, very small. But uh, we should understand that uh, with radio waves, we usually deal with very small angles, uh, very shallow incidences. Uh, like the experiment we have here, uh, the experiment here is done with uh, light with uh, 0.6 micrometers wavelength. Over 2 meters, over 1 meter here. This is a scale, uh, so the experiment we have, so if we have a uh, wavelength of uh, 632 nanometers. This means that the scale is uh, scaled experiment of 1 to 10,000. So uh, scale 1 to 10,000, 2 meters of distance becomes 20 kilometers. And 20 kilometers is a typical distance for a radio link. And the wavelength, now the wavelength scaled, is about now six millimeters. That's microwave. So a microwave radio over two kilom uh, 20 kilometers link is the same as the laser light over two meters. So we are exactly in scale. The experiment, so uh, this experiment shows you uh, how shallow are these angles. Uh, these angles are very shallow here, very shallow angle. Also, when we go over the obstacle, we see very, very shallow angles. Uh, these angles here are very small. Also, this angle here is very small. And also, these angles here are very, very small. This one here, and maybe this one here, the refracted ray. And the refraction effects, uh, also reflections, also diffraction, are the, the largest when the angles are shallow. And our practical use of microwaves for earth links on the ground 
for ground-based links, microwave links, is exactly this, this one with very, very shallow angles. We should understand that all the way around. And uh, though we get equations, exact equations that are valid for any angle, uh, well, for these small differences, this would not even matter if the angle was very, very steep here. But if the angle is shallow, then we have such a problem. And uh, I, I have to do my experiments in scale. So what can we do now? Uh, today we are, uh, we are going to talk about diffraction. Uh, next time we are going to talk about reflection. And maybe considering atmospheric effect, we are going to talk also about uh, refraction. Though refraction, we did that exactly in the course of optics. In the course of optics, we derived exactly the Fresnel equations for the refraction. But uh, uh, we are not going to deal in, to repeat now the same thing we already told in optics, but we are just going to use known results from the optics uh, back to the scale of the experiment in the radio waves. So in the case of an obstacle, what can we do in the case of an obstacle? Say so I have a couple of antennas trying to overcome a very large obstacle. Well, if we look at popular ideas, how people think about these, these things, let's call Professor Balthazar, the one from the cartoons, the famous cartoons, and Professor Balthazar will bring his machine and he's going to drill a tunnel in this obstacle. obstacle. Okay? That's the typical way people think about such problems. Uh, so, uh, to calculate this thing, what uh, do I have here? Uh, I have a transmitting antenna that has uh, gain of the transmitting antenna, gain of the receiving antenna. But I have here an, a tunnel that has an area of the tunnel. Uh, at distance of transmitter and here distance of the receiver. Now let's calculate this link. What do we get? What amount of power do I get in the tunnel? Power in the tunnel is the gain of the, uh, is the power of the transmitter. Power of the transmitter times uh, gain of the transmitting antenna. Uh, divided so uh, by uh, 4 pi r transmitter squared uh, multiplied by the area of the tunnel. What is the power being received in the receiver? The power being received in the receiver is now the power that's available in the tunnel. Hopefully this tunnel does not introduce additional loss. It's a good waveguide with uh, metal plated walls with uh, very low losses, so we don't consider that problem. Uh, multiplied by the gain of the tunnel, because this antenna has a certain uh, aperture illumination here, uh, the aperture behaves as a directional antenna. Uh, and on the receiving side, what, what we have on the receiving side, here we have the uh, area of the receiver, efficiency of the receiver, uh, divided by 4 pi uh, r receiver squared. Now, what is the gain of the tunnel? The gain of the tunnel, uh, it's just an aperture. The gain of the tunnel, is, if it's a uniformly illuminated aperture. A uniformly illuminated aperture will be just uh, uh, 4 pi over lambda squared times uh, the area of the tunnel with no additional losses. Uh, so we have all the equations now on the board. I could also replace this uh, uh, area of the receiver with the uh, gain of the receiving antenna. But uh, the whole equations, now the whole equation, uh, this uh, power in the receiver is proportional to the power 
proportional, I will just uh, write all the constants inside the constant alpha proportional to the transmitter, okay? But it's inversely proportional to the R of the transmitter squared, R of the receiver squared. Thinking about making tunnels in, antenna, in uh, mountains. Uh, this thing doesn't work because this receiving power decays very quickly with the distance. De decays with the fourth power of the distance. So here is squared, here is squared. With the fourth power of the distance where we were used for free space that the received power only decays with the square of the distance, not with the fourth power of the distance. So this is certainly, uh, certainly questionable what we got here. This is very low. If I in put fit, fit one equation into another and look at the final result. So this is probably not the way to go to drill tunnels in the mountains. Okay, I could improve this thing by making a very large aperture of this tunnel. Maybe throwing down the whole mountain. <laughs> well, probably the, they will not allow us to uh, throw down a mountain just to put a radio leak. That's not the solution to do it. So we have to uh, see what can we do without the tunnel. No tunnels being drilled because they don't let us do that. And let's see what happens now if I have an obstacle somewhere in the path of my ray. So the idea here is basically to uh, represent the obstacle I had and the remaining area that's available. Uh, to represent the remain, remaining clear area as a, a large group of Huygens sources. So let's see what, how do Huygens sources behave in this case. So I have the axis Z horizontal and the axis Z is actually interconnecting my transmitter and my receiver. I'm looking just at omnidirectional transmitters and receivers. Why? Uh, you see it clearly here. Uh, the area where I'm receiving, I may have a directional antenna there, the laser may be a directional antenna, but uh, 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 its beam is very narrow and it's wholly used by the receiver. So uh, actually it doesn't really matter whether I made a calculation for my calculation for directional antennas or for omnidirectional antennas, uh, because the mechanism of diffraction is going to be the same for both. And here in the space in between, I have my Huygens sources. Okay, let's mark the uh, axis. Here, this is x axis is really vertical. Uh, y axis is horizontal. And here I have my Huygens sources in the xy plane. X, y plane. Uh, the Huygens sources, where is it located? Uh, let's put some markings. On my, so the distance from the obstacle to the transmitters is a distance uh, d from the transmitter. And the horizontal distance from the receiver to the obstacle is d from the receiver. The actual Huygens source is somewhere on a somewhat different distances. So this is R to the transmitter and this is uh, R to the receiver. That's the Huygens source and uh, uh, I'm not uh, discussing yet the way we are going to integrate. We are going to integrate actually in different ways these Huygens sources. We'll see that the most straightforward way is not the best way to do it. Uh, and uh, what I'm also going to mark, I'm going to mark these angles, this uh, theta of the transmitter. And this angle here is theta of the receiver. So now what is the field uh, up here? If I have omnidirectional devices, so the electric field uh, is zero without vector signs because uh, we know that uh, 
in the case of Huygens sources, the Huygens source is independent of the polarization. So I'm uh, intentionally not writing any vector signs on it. This is zero on the aperture, is zero of x and of y function, is now proportional to what? Is pro uh, proportional constant to the current feeding the transmitter. So this transmitter is fed with the current i. Depending now how the antenna is done, this proportional constant is. And now I have its uh, uh, space dependence. It's uh, inversely proportional to the distance, r of the transmitter. And uh, I have the phase e to the minus j k wave number r transmitter. So this is actually the field of the transmitter at the position of the Huygens source. I have to account this distance. The angle does not yet play a role yet here. And then uh, what is the DE provided to the receiver of this Huygens source? The DE is now proportional to what? Again, I am not uh, uh, writing any uh, vector signs because uh, uh, the Huygens source is independent of polarization. Furthermore, the theta Tx and theta Rx angles are very, very small here. You see in this experiment in the scale, uh, these angles are very small and they do not play a role in our calculation. What is the uh, field of the Huygens source? J over 2 lambda. Uh, here I have electric field on the aperture. X and Y. I have the delay to the receiver. This is proportional to the e to the minus j k r receiver divided by r receiver. And uh, so I have phase and amplitude, uh, electric field at the point here. And I have further, I have the uh, the radiation pattern of the Huygens source, the Huygens source is not omnidirectional as Huygens supposed to simply to do this with point sources, with omnidirectional point sources. It has some kind of radiation pattern. And this radiation pattern is 1 plus cosine theta. That was our usual discussion. So where do our angles theta come? If I draw here uh, a normal to the xy plane, because the Huygens is xy plane, I have a theta receiver also here, and I have a theta transmitter also here. So if the, uh, now if the uh, transmitter was far, far away to produce a plane wave here, then uh, so if uh, r of the transmitter uh, goes to infinity, then uh, the radiation pattern of our Huygens source is 1 plus cosine theta receiver. Okay? This is what we did with the, the aperture. We illuminated the aperture with a plane wave coming from infinity. Coming from infinity, just pushing our transmitter to infinity. But uh, if uh, the distance of the transmitter is not infinity, then uh, what we have, we have that cosine of theta uh, transmitter is actually smaller than 1. And this radiation pattern becomes, uh, after a lengthy derivation, uh, cosine theta transmitter plus cosine theta receiver. And this fits perfectly because if I go to infinity, this means that theta transmitter goes to zero, and if theta is zero, this is one. So it fits perfectly, but this is a little bit more lengthy explanation what happens here. So I have here another term. So I have cosine theta transmitter plus cosine uh, theta receiver. And this comes out from the finite distance dtx of the transmitter. 
It's a small distance and it's an amplitude variation. It is usually not important in our calculations and will, it will not be important even today. But uh, I just want to uh, be complete here, how we are going to do doing these things. So uh, now I have to integrate over the whole xy plane wherever I have, uh, wherever I have uh, uh, Huygens sources. If I have a screen, if I have a shield, then the, the, the Huygens sources are equal to zero. And now we have to see what we would like to find out actually in this lecture is how much space does it take to, uh, to transmit a radio wave without any influence. So how much space does a radio wave take propagating from the transmitter to the receiver? Certainly not the whole universe. Less than that. But we don't know how much. And that's, that's what we don't know. How much space do we need? So the most uh, uh, straightforward way to do these things is actually to uh, put a screen in the xy plane. So x and here is y. Put a screen with a hole drilled in this screen. So I have a screen that has a circular hole in it. And it's a screen elsewhere. Elsewhere else, it's a, there's a screen, there's a, an opaque screen, so no radiation can get to these screens. So I only have Huygens sources over this circular area. Area, say, we may have say that this area has a radius A. And on this area, I'll make have my Huygens sources. that are located where? Are located at the radius rho and uh, they are located at an angle phi. So I'm using polar coordinates here, uh, uh, rho uh, phi uh, z in the xy plane. Uh, z is of course equal to zero here. Uh, z is equal to zero in the xy plane is equal to zero. Uh, just to sum up my Huygens sources. So here I have to integrate now the whole electric field. Integrate the whole electric field. So electric field as an integral of dE. Where do I have to integrate dE? Uh, I have to integrate from 0 to a over rho and from 0 to 2 pi over Makes sense. And uh, using polar coordinates, because po for a circular hole, polar coordinates are the natural choice. Let's write now all the equations one into another to uh, solve this problem. So the whole field E now is E of the receiver, is integral from 0 to a over rho from 0. Oh, sorry, I forgot here the unit area dx dy, uh, the unit area of this uh, uh, dx and dy, the area of my Hagen source. I forgot here. Uh, finding out d because uh, the coordinates have to cancel out. So this is matters, matters, uh, this is matters, and this is matters in the uh, numerator. Uh, in the denominator. In the denominator, matters, uh, matters, matters in the numerator. So I get electric fields from electric fields. So the units match. I forgot this, this dx dy here. So to 2 pi, now let's write everything that goes in here. Alpha i. Then I have uh, this uh, j over 2 lambda. I have uh, uh, this product. Uh, I have R uh, T X R R X and I have exponent function. The product of two exponent functions is the exponent functions of the su sum of the two exponents. Minus J K R T X plus R R X. Okay? If I multiply this by this, I have the cosines. Uh, 
cosine theta rx. I have the cosine. And uh, furthermore, I have the unit area. So from dx, dy in Cartesian coordinates, in polar coordinates, this is rho, d rho, d phi in the polar coordinates, the unit area, the element, ele element of area here. So this is rho, d rho, uh, d phi. OK? So now let's see what comes out of this, uh, this uh, now, this lengthy uh, uh, description here. So alpha i j over 2 lambda is not part of the integral. Alpha i uh, j over 2 lambda is not part of the integral. Everything else only depends on rho. Because rho is which distance? Rho is the distance actually here. If I write it here, rho is this distance. And there's a right angle here. So I can express rtx from rho. rtx is square root of dtx squared plus rho squared. And uh, R, rx is square root of drx squared plus rho squared. Okay. So these are only a function of rho, of rho. Uh, these are also a function of rho. Uh, phi does not matter here, so I can integrate over phi from 0 to 2 pi. I get the 2 pi in front. Okay. And now what is left inside the integral? I only have the integral from 0 to a. Uh, I have the exponent function up here e to the minus j k uh, r t x plus r r x. But I will have to express them from the equations. I have in the uh, numer denominator, I have r t x plus r r x. And I have the cosines, cosine of uh, uh, theta t x plus cosine of theta rx. I have a rho d rho that, <coughs> OK, I may leave it the way as it is right now. Uh, what do I have to do? I said earlier that uh, angles are very small. Theta tx, theta rx are very small in a real radio link. This is a, a scale. Uh, scale representation of the real rings, but it, it's to scale. It's to scale. It's 1 to 10,000. So this is correct. Perfectly correct. So uh, uh, the amplitude variations will be very small. It's only the phase that will matter. And I have to make an approximate calculation of these square roots here. Uh, approximations for these square roots using the, just the first terms is to pull dtx out. Because dtx is much larger, uh, so dtx and drx are much larger than rho. This is a very small cross section here compared to the long distance. They're very small. Uh, the rho is very small, so the rho square is very small. And uh, this is approximately drx. Correct it to the first term, 1 plus 1 plus. Uh, rho squared divided by dtx uh, squared. Uh, approximately square rooting it gives you rho squared dtx squared uh, divided by 2 because the square root of 1 plus epsilon is approximately uh, 1 plus epsilon half. This is an approximation. And also the same approximation here. Uh, rho squared divided by 2d rx squared. Okay. These changes are very small. In the amplitude, these changes will change very little in the uh, denominator here. Uh, they change very little with the cosines. Also, cosines will be very close to 1. So this, uh, this will be actually close to 2 for small angles. And this thing here will be actually uh, d t 
dx plus drx, approximately. But I should not neglect any changes in the phase. In the phase, I should stay accurate because the phase actually can change. I can get immediately microns of differences here uh, by uh, moving across this obstacle, and they will make a difference here in the uh, numerator. There will, be, there will be differences. So I have to make now my approximation. Uh, my approximation is for E is approximately. Uh, now it's alpha times I times uh, J, uh, J over lambda. The two cancels out here, these two cancels, times 2 pi of the integral over phi. Uh, and now I have uh, 1 over uh, dtx plus drx. This was the denominator here. But I still have to integrate the numerator. Integrate the numerator from 0 to a. Uh, the numerator e to the minus jk. And now I have to pull, put these approximations in my uh, calculation here. This sum here, I have to use the exact, the more accurate values for the RTX and RX, there are still approximations, but at least there are approximations, uh, not just the largest term, but also the next larger term. And what I have here, I have DTX plus DRX uh, plus uh, I have uh, uh, here a row squared, a row squared. Uh, divided by 2 dtx. If I multiply this with dtx, 1 goes away. It's no longer squared. Uh, plus uh, rho squared over 2 drx. Uh, end of parallel. And this is all exponent. This is all exponent. Times rho d rho. This is d rho squared half. So this is a simplification now because I'm going to integrate over rho squared. And if I integrate over rho squared, I have from rho, to go from rho squared is equal to 0 to rho squared is equal to a squared. I have to write my, my, the limits of my integral, uh, the start and uh, end of my integral with approximate, uh, appropriate units. If I integrate over rho squared, then it's rho squared up there. Okay. This term is actually a constant, so I could write this out of my integral. So E is equal alpha i uh, j over lambda, uh, not to lambda, just lambda. Lambda equals the two cancels out, uh, 2 pi. Uh, here I have E to the minus jk uh, dtx plus drx. The first section, I write it out because it's not a function of rho squared. Uh, divided by dtx plus drx. And this makes sense because this is actually the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, this sum. So it's something that has a physical meaning here on this, uh, this uh, drawing. But I am left with the integral. The integral going from 0 to a squared, uh, e to the minus jk. Uh, let's uh, denote uh, rho squared a new variable u, so I don't have problems here. I have jk u. Uh, 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 and now I have 1 over 2 dtx uh, plus, uh, no, I'm not here, the plus, the plus is here, plus 1 over 2 drx u du. And this is maybe simpler to, simpler to integrate. It's a simple exponent function over u, so it's simple to integrate this thing. Uh, what remains outside now? What remains? Uh, I still have this constant here. This is a constant 1 over 
1 over 2 dtx uh, plus 1 over 2 drx. Now this thing here is uh, 2. The common uh, denominator is dtx uh, drx. And the numerator is dtx plus drx. Just to, to write it maybe in a simpler fashion. I can, could simplify this thing in this way. But let's take uh, this uh, parenthesis as a whole because I have to integrate over du. What is now the integral over du? Uh, the electric field is now uh, alpha i uh, j over lambda uh, 2 pi. Uh, this exponent function e to the minus j k r. Uh, jk not r, jk times parenthesis dtx, uh, dtx plus drx over dtx plus drx. I'm just rewriting down now the same thing, very boring to do something. Uh, but this integral now is, the integral of an exponent function is again an exponent function, is a to the minus jk u. Uh, 1 over, uh, so let's, let's write now the whole, uh, the simplif in the simplified version, uh, using this simplification here. Uh, dtx plus drx uh, divided twice dtx drx, just to have it shorter. In what range? In the range from 0 to a squared. Uh, and in front of it, I have everything that was uh, besides. So I have 1 over minus j k. Uh, and I have here uh, also this dtx drx uh, dtx uh, no, plus, plus in, uh, in the numerator, uh, multiplication in the denominator twice. Okay, have to rewrite all these things. Uh, I am actually not interested in what stays ahead. If I did the calculation, I could also calculate it. But I'm also only interested in this value of this integral here. What is this? Uh, if I uh, eat this minus sign here. If I eat, I can put a minus sign in front here. Or, or without this minus sign here, I could just flip uh, the bounds of the integral. So going from a squared to a squared to 0, I can eat this sign here. Uh, I can also cancel other things out here. Look, j cancels out. J cancels out. Uh, what happens about k? Uh, k is 2 pi over lambda. So k cancels exactly out with the 2 pi and the lambda. Uh, and also some other things do cancel out here. But uh, let's look at uh, just this uh, 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 the expression I have over here, just this integral, this integral i. What does it happen with the integral i? The integral i in these bounds is i at a squared has a minus sign, the plus sign has a 0. At 0, this thing here is exactly equal to 1. 1 minus at the bottom end of the integral is e to the minus j k uh, a squared. Uh, uh, times this thing here, so 2 times dtx drx uh, dtx plus drx. So this is an exponent function of a completely imaginary argument. So this is uh, uh, as magnitude is unit and it only changes the phase. Uh, what is now the graphical solution to this thing here? 
the graphical solution, just to express it graphically. Uh, to, uh, I don't want now to get the mathematical derivation. I want to explain what is going on actually here. Uh, graphically, if I have a polar uh, and a complex plane, I have real axis, I have imaginary axis. I have this one and this one is here. One is here. And then I have, uh, I subtract from this one, I subtract this value here. So this is something that has an increasing delay and is subtracting from the, subtracting from the one. Uh, so it's minus and uh, uh, this actually has a negative angle here. Uh, should be this way, but she should be actually subtracted from this one. So subtracting it, I should, uh, uh, okay, I can, uh, this is something that is rotating over here, rotating over the angle one. So this thing can go from zero up to two. This point here is at two. So let's write now just the absolute value of this integral. Oh, I have all the, all my desk, I have filled everything. So let's write what happens here with I, absolute value of this integral. And uh, let's write down here, let's write A. Where does the integral go? If I write here one and if I write here two. So this integral as uh, this phasor is rotating around here goes from zero up to two, for to z back to zero, back to two. At uh, the argument a squared is equal to zero, this is actually zero. So we start with zero. And then we oscillate between 0 and 2. And thus, as the argument increases, this oscillation is even denser, denser, and denser. A very strange result now. If we go back to our uh, uh, experiment, so if I increase the radius of the hole in my obstacle, the field does not reach a stable value, but is oscillating all of the time. That sounds strange. That sound re sounds really strange. And uh, uh, what could we now think of what is actually going on here. So, well, this was a question already 200 years ago. When the French Academy of Science proposed a contest to come up with the best possible theory about light propagation. And this was 200 years ago, shortly after Napoleon. After Napoleon was de defeated, the French Academy of Sciences proposed this problem and uh, uh, the end, an entrant in the contest was also a guy named Fresnel. Fresnel was a civil engineer. He was not a, not a mathematician. And he proposed the solution making this integral here. And uh, of course, the French Academy of Science have many important scientists, and one of them was the famous mathematician Poisson. A very famous mathematician. Now, so now, what is a civil engineer? Uh, Fresnel was building bridges, 
Maybe we have them even in Slovenia here because many bridges in Slovenia are called the Napoleon Bridge. It was not a Paul Napoleon that designed that bridge. It was Fresnel that designed that, that bridge because Fresnel was the civil engineer under Napoleon. And what could a civil engineer teach now a famous mathematician like Poisson? And Poisson said, look, if your theory, theory holds true, then what should happen if we have the opposite situation? If we have uh, not uh, 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 an, 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 an opaque screen with a round aperture, but we have just the opposite, so we have uh, most of the free space, but a round obstacle. So if we have between the transmitter and the receiver, if we have a round obstacle, so this is now my obstacle here, transmitter and receiver. Uh, if the Fresnel theory holds true, if this integral holds true, I should obtain twice the field. Well, in fact, what happens uh, according to the Fresnel integrals, uh, I will make a drawing here now, uh, the transmitter is our light source. So in the receiving plane, according to geometrical theory, uh, just the drawing rays, I should obtain here, if I plot here the electric field, uh, according to the distance x, see? I should obtain, according to geometry, I should obtain here full illumination, and a perfect shade in between here. This is the geometric theory and uh, Poisson said after, a, after an obstacle I cannot have any light here because this is shade. It cannot be true that I get any light here but uh, the integrals of this crazy guy Fresnel show it different. What do the integrals of the Fresnel show? Show it that here I have many, if I uh, calculated that integral exactly on a computer, I have some of oscillation here, but exactly in the middle, I should obtain a bright spot. There is some oscillation up here. Uh, oscillations are due to uh, diffraction, but I should obtain this bright spot here. And Poisson said, this is impossible, so the integrals of Fresnel must be wrong. Well, there was yet a third guy in the story, and his name was Arago. Arago was the president, as well, Arago was a politician. He was the president of the French Academy of Sciences. As, as every politician, Arago tried to move somewhere between a famous mathematician and between a promising young scientist. Uh, unfortunately, Fresnel died very young, he was sick. And uh, so he proposed an experiment. And Arago himself did the experiment. Did the experiment that we see here. Here we have a perfectly round, here we have a, a point source of light. We are using a laser, but it's not necessary to use a laser. It's enough to have a point source of light, a very small aperture like uh, Arago used 200 years ago. Here we have a round obstacle, but this obstacle has to be really round for the integrals to hold, for the in this kind of integration to hold. Uh, what I'm using here, I'm using a ball taken out of uh, a ball taken out of a uh, 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 a ball take, take, taken out of, uh, take out, out of a bicycle, out of the bearings, a ball bearings of the bicycle. Uh, ball bearings need to have highly polished balls to be uh, so that the, your bicycle runs perfectly. And what do I see here? Here I see the spot generated by the laser, and I look now at the 
at my shade. What do I see in, in the center of the shade? It's maybe better that you come all come here and see what is can be seen. Maybe we turn also the lights uh, slightly down to see it better. What we, do we see in the center of the shade of this ball? Come here, come here. Come closer. What do we see in the center of the shade of our ball? Also here we see the, the dot in the center of the shade. If I have a rectangular obstacle, there is no such effect for a rectangular obstacle. If I have a larger ball, you can see maybe a, a fainter dot, but still uh, if we, we would darken here the room, we could see this dot here. We can see the same effect as soon as we have a, a circular obstacle. Circular obstacle or here, here we can see uh, that we don't see, actually here, here, here the slit becomes very narrow under the ball, between the magnet holding the ball and the ball, and we see many other diffraction effects here. So the dot is actually there. So our, our derivation on the board is actually correct. <laughs>